predators who ever lived on our planet. Nineteen ninety eight's Godzilla, directed by Roland Emmerich. Well, we've made it. Took me long enough, but we will now be covering the first American made Godzilla film. After 1995's Godzilla vs. Destroya, Toho was eager to hand off their giant monster to the US, but this didn't mean the Japanese were done with their favorite movie star. In 1997, a TV show called Godzilla Island that used almost exclusively action figures premiered in Japan. Godzilla would fight alongside other monsters to combat invading kaiju and was much more in line with the monster's Showa era feel. The show would run for about a year with a new episode every weekday with a runtime of about three minutes. Toho would release a video game in 1998 called Godzilla Movie Studio Tour. As the name suggests, you would take a tour of a virtual Toho Studios. The player could take scenes from different Godzilla films and edit them together to make their own original film. So basically, you could make all monsters attack. It was mostly an information database for all the different monsters, and players could also print posters and other Godzilla-related items. Toho had also produced three Mothra movies under the Rebirth of Mothra trilogy in 1996, 97, and 98. King Ghidorah and a new monster named Desa Ghidorah would appear in the villain role in two of the movies. The Heisei Godzilla series and Rebirth of Mothra trilogy don't share any continuity, however. In previous videos, I've already covered the events of 1993, which included screenwriters Terry Razio and Ted Elliott's attempt at making an American Godzilla film where Godzilla battles a monster called the Griffin. I also covered John DeBont's brief attachment to the project and its eventual journey to development hell. In 1996, Godzilla would be honored in the United States with the MTV Lifetime Achievement Award, presented by legendary actor Patrick Stewart. When I was a young man growing up in the north of England, I remember going to see the films of tonight's honoree and being impressed by his quiet strength, his ability to cut to the core of what a scene was about. You couldn't take your eyes off him. He could tell a whole story with just a gesture or with the raising of an eyebrow. And um, we've all heard about his temper, about the people he stepped on on his way to the top. But despite all that, or perhaps even because of it, he is beloved by millions the world over. In this business of stars and superstars, it will be no exaggeration to say that he is the biggest. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Godzilla. The MTV Movie Awards presents the Lifetime Achievement Award to Godzilla. Don't call it a comeback! As a result of some infuriating bureaucracy, whether it's the Department of Agriculture or Department of Immigration, unfortunately, Godzilla cannot be with us tonight. But speaking on his behalf, her behalf, its behalf is the man who produced many of his classic films, Shogo Tomiyama. Thank you, MTV, for awarding Godzilla this honor. The staff here at Toho are shooting our new Mothra movie, but express their heartfelt gratitude and appreciation. I think, however, that Godzilla himself is the happiest of us all. As the 90s went on, Sony repeatedly tried to get Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin to rescue this American Godzilla project. 
Both men were coming off the commercially successful blockbuster film Independence Day that released in June of 1996. They also built a reputation of making blockbuster films at a discounted price. Say what you will about Independence Day, the dialogue is corny as hell and a lot of stuff doesn't make sense, but as a kid I thought it kicked ass. Independence Day is the quintessential My God movie. Oh my god. Jurassic Park gave us the special effect dinosaurs, and Independence Day gave us a movie with global stakes and massive aerial battles. I wanted a Godzilla movie that combined what these two films did well. After Emmerich and Devlin read Razio and Elliot's story, they realized this was something that could be done, but only on the condition that they could discard Elliot and Razio's screenplay and write their own. It had some really cool things in it, but it's something I never would have done. The last half was like watching two creatures go at it. I simply don't like that. TriStar accepted Emmerich's conditions, but Toho responded by writing down all the rules Emmerich must follow if he was going to make a Godzilla film. It was a Godzilla Bible of sorts. Some of Toho's rules were as follows. Godzilla must be created by nuclear weapons, and there must be three rows of dorsal fins. The monster must not eat people, and Godzilla can't die. Emmerich and Devlin would hire Patrick Totopoulos to design the new Godzilla. Totopoulos would say that the original Godzilla film in 1954 was possibly the reason he got into creature design to begin with. Emmerich faxed Totopoulos the Toho Godzilla Bible, but he apparently never received it. In September of 1996, Emmerich and Totopoulos traveled to Tokyo and met with Toho. Shogo Tomiyama and Koichi Kawakita would be there, and Tomiyama would be in contact with Tomiyuki Tanaka as well. In a dramatic moment, Emmerich would reveal Totopolis' new American Godzilla design to the Toho executives. The design showed Godzilla as a slender, fit, giant iguana with a prominent chin, inspired by the tiger from Jungle Book, Shere Khan. The monster's appearance was met with silence from the people at Toho. But Emmerich made it clear to them, Guys, we either do it like this, or we don't do it at all. The meeting ended with no decision being made, but the next morning the project would be approved by Toho. Even Emmerich was shocked. Judging by their reaction, he didn't think he won them over, and perhaps he didn't win them over. Unbeknownst to Emmerich, Toho had no other big directors lined up to take on this Godzilla project. So whether they liked Totopolis' design or not, they didn't have much of a choice. Toho saw the serious money Independence Day reeled in worldwide, and the opportunity to have Godzilla do the numbers Independence Day did was too good to pass up. Emmerich made his intentions clear. I didn't want to make the original Godzilla. I wanted nothing to do with it. I wanted to make my own. Diehard Godzilla fans may ask, if he doesn't like monsters fighting each other and he has no interest in the original source material, then why make a Godzilla movie? Emmerich didn't want to make a monster movie, he just wanted an excuse to make a disaster movie. There were also signs of clear disdain of the later Japanese Godzilla films, if not disdain, an indifference. Emmerich didn't want his movie to be seen as campy like Godzilla vs. Megalon was. The 1977 airing of that movie on NBC hosted by John Belushi can't be understated. That viewing influenced a lot of opinions about Godzilla for non-Godzilla fans. Imagine having no knowledge of the franchise and then you turn your TV on and see Godzilla teaming up with Jet Jaguar fighting Megalon and Gigan. It was obvious that Emmerich and Devlin wanted to get as far away from this as possible. It'll look like Godzilla, but be more realistic. More to the lizard genesis than just a big fat guy in a rubber suit. Yep, bunch of fatties those suit actors were. Emmerich would reportedly watch around 15 Godzilla movies before giving up, claiming they're the same movie over and over again. This was clearly a symbiotic deal between Emmerich and Toho. Toho gets a lot of money and doesn't have to do anything, and Emmerich gets to create his own disaster movie, while borrowing the Godzilla name. As an 8-year-old Godzilla fan at the time, to say I was excited would be an understatement. All those old Godzilla VHSs I had looping on my TV during my childhood were always something that I viewed as inherently my own thing. Nobody I knew at school cared about Godzilla, so to see something I enjoyed by my lonesome now being brought to the forefront of American popular culture, I felt oddly proud. Not lame. Emmerich and Devlin would fly to Mexico and isolate themselves so they could write Godzilla. They would take with them copies of King Kong, Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, and some Godzilla films. Five weeks later, they came back to the U.S. with their screenplay. Principal photography began on May 1st, 1997 and wrapped up on September 26th. Filming took place in New York City from May 3rd to May 26th and moved to Los Angeles in June. 
Tropical scenes would be filmed in the Hawaiian Islands, and the United States Marine Corps would even participate in the filming of this movie. The marketing strategy concentrated on Godzilla's size, with the overall design being kept a secret. One of the first teasers for the movie would be shown before Men in Black in the summer of 1997. All I'll say, the hairs on my arms stood up. Again, I felt oddly proud, like, yeah, this is my thing and everybody's gonna see why Godzilla kicks ass. The trailer takes a small dig at Jurassic Park with Godzilla's foot smashing the T-Rex skeleton. Godzilla's foot was our first clue that this design would be different from the old Godzilla. The marketing team would also use the tagline, size does matter. The sexual connotation went over my head, but this tongue-in-cheek slogan was plastered everywhere. More marketing that focused on the monster's size were all over Manhattan, which would be the setting of the film. Crushed cars were placed around London as well. And of course, Godzilla tie-in commercials would be aired. Hey, Godzilla, want something to drink? Godzilla's at Taco Bell on four collector cups, and now you can put them in a cool Godzilla cup holder. There'd also be different toy lines announced. Godzilla, size does matter. We pinned Godzilla with our tanks and all-terrain vehicles, and the beast's tail is power slashing back. And in lead up to the movie, Joe Bob Briggs would air Godzilla, King of the Monsters on TNT's Monster Vision. You know, nobody has anything good to say about nuclear radiation, and it created more than 30 Godzilla movies. Though not directly tied to the movie's promotion, a Godzilla picture book titled Who's Afraid of Godzilla would be published in 1998 that showed Godzilla as a lonely monster on Monster Island just trying to make friends. But the biggest pop culture collaboration was the Come With Me theme song and music video made for the film. This song was featured heavily in marketing for the movie and plays briefly in the background during the film itself, and again over the end credits. Come With Me is performed by American rapper Sean Combs, aka Puff Daddy, and recreates the Led Zeppelin song Kashmir. Jimmy Page would play guitar during the song as well. So this was it. Japan's big star was ready for his American close-up. The film starts off with stock footage of U.S. hydrogen bomb tests. We see a specific nuclear test being conducted in what's supposed to be French Polynesia, where the French government is doing tests of their own, exposing an iguana and its nest to the radioactive fallout. You also see a bearded dragon in this shot, which I love because I had a bearded dragon named Burner when I was younger. Yeah, I literally named the poor thing Burner because I thought fire burns stuff and it's a dragon, so Burner. Right. But anyway, so far, so good. This is what Godzilla should be. Just like Uncle Ben getting killed in Spider-Man or Bruce Wayne's parents dying, this is the origin story. But just like those references, this updated version takes liberties. The United States is no longer the cause of Godzilla. This time it's France, and this was sort of topical as two years prior, in 1996, the French government stopped conducting nuclear tests in that region. This quick origin is then followed by a jump to modern day, where we see a nice tip of the hat to the original film, with a Japanese ship named the Kobayashi Maro being attacked by a giant creature in the South Pacific. The ship's name is a Star Trek reference, but let's pretend it's a reference to our old friend Kobayashi from Godzilla Raids Again. This movie is off to an amazing start. The claws piercing into the ship look so badass, and I remember having goosebumps in the theater and thinking, this is going to be great. And then this scene happened. In the rain, what a I'm a Why are you the way that you are? Yes, so Matthew Roderick would play Dr. Nick Tatopoulos, who's a biologist working at the Chernobyl nuclear accident site studying worms. If we compare it to the 1954 original Tatopoulos, the name being a reference to the creature designer, is sort of the Dr. Yamane of this film. Like Dr. Yamane, he studies Godzilla's footprints to help determine what humanity is about to deal with. Whether fair or unfair, people generally see Broderick as the face of this movie's overall disappointment. Nothing 
is happening. Nothing is happening. Steven? This is a safe place. You're with people who love you. I hate you! To me, he's just sort of whatever. I didn't find Dr. Nick to be interesting or annoying. Hi, everybody! Hi, Hi Dr. Dr. Nick. Nick. Speaking of The Simpsons, two characters were played by Simpsons veterans Harry Shear and Hank Azaria. Teach me just the, the first part of that. Mm. Thank you. Bart Simpson's voice actress, Nancy Cartwright, also makes a brief appearance, along with Barney the Dinosaur, in a scene that was pretty funny, actually. But all that aside, the movie was still off to a great start, and things get back on track by showing the only survivor of the vessel we saw earlier. What did you see, old man? Kujira. Kujira. The mood was set, and then the moment I'd been waiting for arrives. Godzilla comes ashore Manhattan, which is actually the second time a creature named Godzilla appeared in the Big Apple. In 1968, we saw Godzilla destroy the UN building in New York City. Being a New Yorker myself, it added a little something special to the whole scenario. Godzilla wasn't only in America, he was attacking my area specifically. This new American Godzilla rises out of the East River and takes a giant step over FDR Drive and makes his way to Wall Street. Emmerich and Devlin did a great job making Manhattan itself a character in this film. In the early 90s and 2000s, I always enjoyed seeing New York City on the big screen, when it was done right. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man comes to mind. Impressive. My dad took me to see this movie, and he couldn't give two shits about Godzilla but even he was enjoying this part. He used to drive a truck all over New York City for a living, so seeing a monster stomp through East 42nd Street and put a giant hole in the MetLife building on Park Avenue was just wild to see. Myself, I could barely stay still in my seat. Hearing Godzilla's altered digital roar as New Yorkers ran away, it was just awesome. After Godzilla's arrival, we see the military set up base in New Jersey, and this is when the movie begins its downward spiral. We, uh we lost sight of it, sir. You want to run that by me again? You what? A after its initial at attack, he, uh, disappeared. I'll address them losing a giant lizard a little later, but TriStar's Godzilla takes a much different tack to Toho's Godzilla. Whereas the Toho monster would stoically continue its onslaught of a major city, this American creature runs and hides within the buildings of Manhattan. TriStar's Godzilla is an iguana mutated by a 1968 French nuclear test. The animal uses its agility, speed, and smarts to outmaneuver and outsmart the U.S. military. It can run over 300 miles an hour and can also burrow underground with its sharp claws. It's an impressive swimmer, too. It doesn't have atomic breath, but instead uses its power breath, which is just a gust of flammable gas that smells like fish. Because it loves eating fish. They discussed including Atomic Breath, but then cut it because the creators wanted this Godzilla to be more believable. This large mutated iguana is vulnerable to conventional weaponry. Besides its size, there was nothing monster-like about this creature, and that was by design. We were creating an animal. We weren't creating a monster. This Godzilla design would be named Toragoji by fans due to the way Tristar sounds in Katakana. Originally, Emmerich played with the idea of giving it the ability to change colors and camouflage itself. Not sure why this was cut. It would have been a fun addition. The dorsal fins looked more like shark fins, which gave that scene with the old man fishing a Jaws feel to it. Also, I hope that old man didn't die. Most of the death in this film is implied, as we don't see any blood or anything gruesome. Mostly just explosions and calamity. TriStar's Godzilla would be brought to life using mostly computer graphics, but there are scenes that employ animatronics and motion capture shots with Godzilla suits. Suitmation may have been looked down upon by most in Hollywood, but the technique was utilized in this big budget film. 170 freelance special effects professionals were hired to help create several different mechanical versions of Godzilla. A 9 meter tall animatronic Godzilla was built and four Godzilla suits were made, and the suit actor was Kurt Carley. Carley studied the movements of alligators and other reptiles to prepare for his scenes. 
Like Toho's Godzilla, small holes were drilled into the suit so the actor could see. The suit had metal leg extenders inside that let the actor stand six inches off the ground with his feet bent forward to help with the forward posture of the animal. Years later, Carly would meet the original Godzilla suit actor Haro Nakajima at a convention, and Carly would joke to Nakajima that he knew the movie was bad, and he was just doing his job. Also, this Godzilla is... He's pregnant. Tristar's Godzilla can reproduce asexually. It's almost like Emmerich and Devlin did this just so they could have their own version of raptors and copy Spielberg's raptor scene from Jurassic Park. The baby Godzillas are a combination of suit acting, animatronics, and CGI. In total, seven suits were made. Like the larger Godzilla, the suits had metal leg extenders built in and would angle the suit actor at a 45 degree angle. For some of the shots, it's pretty obvious they were just digitally cloned. The addition of these baby Godzillas really pissed me off as a kid because I didn't give a shit about them. I came here to see Godzilla, not a bunch of raptor wannabes running around. A 30-foot high animatronic Godzilla torso was built with computer-programmed hydraulic motors. This animatronic would only be used for a few scenes, however. Like when Godzilla has the truck in its mouth, its stare down with Tetopolis, and when Godzilla bites the taxi cab. A one-for-one -one model of the animal's mouth was built for the scene where Godzilla couldn't chomp down on that same taxi and put us all out of our misery. Bottom line, it's obvious when animatronics are being used and when CG is being used. And we mostly get CG. The decision to have it rain the entire movie was said to be for mood, but I would imagine it was to help obscure the CG's lack of finer detail. They needed an army of rain machines in order to make this work, and all the actors had wetsuits on underneath their regular clothes. Which apparently, Broderick was putting on backwards the entire time. Centropolis FX was Emmerich's CG team, and it had roughly 60 animators working on this film. For the CG Godzilla, the animators would scan a tiny Godzilla sculpture sculpted by Tetopolis. The digital model would be called Fred and was said to be capable of up to 500 expressions. I don't want to overlook the fact that a lot of beautiful miniatures were made, like the scaled down Madison Square Garden, Brooklyn Bridge, apartment buildings. They even created a mini East River. So despite a lot of CG being used, there was also a good amount of the practical stuff that I know a lot of Tokusatsu fans love. But it's not Godzilla destroying these buildings. For the most part, it's the military laying waste to Manhattan. Ah, which brings me to the best character in the entire movie. The asshole mayor. You've caused more damage than that goddamn thing did! Alright, mayor, calm down. Just have some candy. No, I don't want any candy. Leave me alone. Every line he had cracked me up, and I know it was supposed to be a parody of Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel, the famous movie critics. But outside of that context, Michael Lerner genuinely has the best lines in the whole movie. Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. That, that how can it be pregnant? What is this, the virgin lizard? <laughs> the real Ebert would go on to give the movie a bad review, calling it a big, ugly, ungainly device to give teenagers the impression they're seeing a movie. If Godzilla worked as a monster movie, I'd be happy, but it doesn't. There's not a single scary shot in the whole movie, and the monster itself lacks the majesty and mystery of the earlier movie Godzillas, even though they were in schlock films. Somebody told me it seemed less like a threat than like a pathetic, frightened animal, and you know, that's right. Roger, I agree with you. You mentioned and complained that the film had all the standard elements of big monster movies. Mm -hmm. It's missing one. Terror. Exactly. I was never afraid of Godzilla. That's absolutely right, Gene. In fact, most of the time, I thought I'm just looking at special effects. I never had the illusion that there was a monster there at all. I just thought this is animation or well, this is some kind big, of a model. You just see a big wrinkly creature, you know, stumbling across the landscape. It's, there's, there's no terror in this film, and that's stunning. I mean, how, I, what did you think about Mayor Ebert and his sidekick, Gene? I thought that seemed uh, petty. Yeah, I did too. It does seem petty, Roger. I mean, I was used as a villain in another picture called The Ref, and Siskel was the name of the villain. And, you know, it's such a distinctive name, an odd name, that, you know, audiences are thinking, uh, well, all right, when's Eber going to show up? Now, you shouldn't be thinking about that during a picture. Yeah, the only good thing about uh, Mayor Ebert and his sidekick was that at least Godzilla didn't step on us. Well, but, Roger, I fully expected that to happen. And I think the audience is waiting for that to happen. Yeah, maybe they should have included that. Again, there... Bring him on stage, at least squish him, right? Exactly. There are missing scenes. 
Jean Renou's Felipe character was enjoyable as well, for the most part. I didn't mind Hank Azaria's animal character either with his over-the-top New York accent. The role of Audrey was played by Maria Patillo, whose performance was so bad that she received the Golden Raspberry Award for Worst Supporting Actress. But other than that, I won't pick on her. Doug Savant plays the most annoying character in the movie, Sergeant O'Neill. Though again, it's not the actor's fault someone told him to act like a stuttering moron. The soundtrack was composed by David Arnold. Nothing stands out, and I think he did a much better job when composing Independence Day's soundtrack with the foreboding alien theme. A little Ifakube would have gone a long way. The ending of the film is still a sore spot for me. Godzilla getting stuck in the Brooklyn Bridge is an inventive way to trap him. I actually like that. But getting killed by some missiles? That just doesn't work for Godzilla. The scene used footage of the actual Brooklyn Bridge combined with a bridge shot in downtown Los Angeles and a model of one section of the bridge. In a somber moment, Godzilla's death is presented as almost tragic with Dr. Nick watching the creature slowly close its eyes and die. This could have been a good moment to possibly show man's hubris created this disaster and we should feel bad for this creature. The film wouldn't earn that moment, but it would at least be coherent. But then Dr. Nick just stops giving a shit and the music is all happy as New Yorkers cheer. Sony said the primary audience was boys, 4 to 11, and they sure got us into the theater, but I couldn't be alone in feeling disappointed. There is no other monster for Godzilla to fight, the animal barely fights the military, and it spends most of the time running away and hiding. The scene in the Hudson River with the submarines and the brief part where Godzilla starts chasing the helicopter were probably the only parts that I felt the US version did well in terms of Godzilla being aggressive and acting like Godzilla should. Despite all the marketing playing up the creature's size, Godzilla is crouched lower to the ground for a lot of the film and we rarely get to see any shots of the entire animal. But this is something that's always been annoying for me in terms of monster films in the US. Directors here seem adverse to showing too many wide shots of giant monsters, I guess so we don't lose perspective on how large the monsters are. But sometimes it seems like these directors want us to feel like we're on some outdated Universal Studios ride, when all I want to see is a full view of the monster. At the end of the day, I think my dad enjoyed this film more than I did. Now, of course, as a child, I was proud of Godzilla, so I defended the film until I stopped caring. But I knew deep down how disappointed I was. Like I said, the first 30 minutes was everything I wanted, and then the wheels fell off from there. Now, in a nice touch, the movie is dedicated to the great Tomoyuki Tanaka, who passed away a month before production began. Godzilla would open in American theaters on May 19, 1998. The opening weekend pulled in $44 million respectively, but after the first week, the reviews were predominantly negative and so the ticket sales dropped significantly after that. Ultimately, it would make $136 million at the box office in the US and make $380 million altogether. Even with the large marketing and special effects budget, the movie made more than enough of a profit to be considered a financial success, though the lack of enthusiasm and backlash from fans and non-fans was swift. A few days after its release, the Godzillas of their respected eras, Haro Nakajima and Kenpachiro Satsuma, were at the Godzilla convention in Chicago where a screening of the American movie was taking place. There are mixed stories about this, but supposedly midway through the screening, Satsuma would get up and walk out, though he would deny this in a later interview. But still, he did not enjoy the film. It's not Godzilla. It doesn't have his spirit. Japanese and future Godzilla director Shusuke Kaneko would say, It is interesting the United States' version runs about trying to escape missiles. They, the Americans, seem unable to accept a creature that cannot be put down by their arms. Though some at Toho would publicly say nice things about the movie. And of course, there are Godzilla fans and non-Godzilla fans who did enjoy the film and still enjoy it to this day. It's important to note, due to scheduling, this movie did not do any test screening, something it definitely could have used. TriStar would receive some backlash from the merchandisers who were told to hold off on putting the merchandise in stores until the movie was out, in order to keep the monster design somewhat mysterious. Normally toys go into the stores beforehand so money can be made while they're still hyped for the film. The poor reception to the movie led to a lot of unsold Godzilla toys. Making matters worse, Taco Bell's meals gave away small toys that would reveal Godzilla's new design anyway. With critics attacking the film, rivals pounced. 
a few employees at Lucas Films would post a parody Size Does Matter movie poster on the Star Wars website. This was in the lead up to The Phantom Menace, though of course Phantom Menace would go on to piss off the Star Wars fan base possibly more than TriStar's Godzilla pissed off Godzilla fans. Devlin didn't help matters when responding to critics on the online Godzilla movie board. Our movie did what it was supposed to do. We're all happy about it. If you don't like that, to hell with you. To his credit, in later years, Devlin would admit he screwed up. I know I screwed up my Godzilla. I think part of the biggest problem was that I pushed Roland into doing the movie because I was a huge Godzilla fan. I grew up with Godzilla and it wasn't something that Roland had grown up with. For his part, Emmerich admitted he regrets having directed it. He claims the shortcomings were due to his lack of interest in Godzilla, the rush schedule, and what he claims was the studio's refusal to screen it for test audiences, though Emmerich will still defend Godzilla as a financial success. The original plan called for a trilogy of Godzilla films as TriStar had the rights to Godzilla until 2003, and the film does end with a Godzilla egg hatching in the ruins of Madison Square Garden to leave the door open for a sequel. This would never happen due to low enthusiasm and budget disagreements between Emmerich and Sony. But a screenplay was written for Godzilla 2 where the Godzilla offspring would grow up and eventually fight a giant insect monster named Queen Bitch. Wow. An animated series would pick up where the movie left off with the Godzilla hatchling seeing Nick Tatopoulos as a parent. I enjoyed the animated series much more than the film, as it had a much more classic Godzilla feel to it, and I could see Godzilla fight other monsters and save the world. And hey, look at that. Atomic breath. Not fish burps. In 2004, Toho would exercise an option in their original contract with Sony signed back in 1992. This allowed them to use the American version of Godzilla in their own films after Sony's rights had expired. When Shogo Tomiyama realized that they could use TriStar's Godzilla in 2004's Godzilla Final Wars, they would trademark the creature as Zilla and put it in the movie. They removed the god from the name because Tomiyama said TriStar had took the god out of Godzilla. In Zilla's appearance, Toho makes a point to show which Godzilla is stronger as the real Godzilla quickly kicks the shit out of Zilla. As an 8 year old boy at the time this movie came out, I had watched a lot of the Japanese Godzilla movies first, so I had a certain expectation going into this. But a lot of other kids back then didn't, and it would be this movie that would get them to start being Godzilla fans. So, despite my misgivings, this film is looked back on fondly by a lot of people who grew up with it being their first exposure to Godzilla. Having rewatched 1998's Godzilla as an adult, and putting aside my childhood disappointment and expectations, my feelings still really haven't changed much. I love the first half hour and become less interested after that. I just don't find a giant, scared animal running amok to be all that entertaining. I felt the same way about Cloverfield. There's also small things that of course bother me, like Godzilla not being able to catch up to a taxi, the monster's inconsistent size, the military not being able to find a giant lizard. I know Manhattan is big, but come on. And of course, as I already said, I couldn't stand Godzilla being killed by a few torpedoes and missiles. To me, they boxed themselves in when they decided to make this creature purely a large animal rather than a monster. That being said, I love the design. I always thought it looked cool, but they didn't do enough with it. In the end, all they did was remake the beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Now, from a butterfly effect standpoint, Godzilla played a big role in the Lord of the Rings movies being made. Director Peter Jackson wanted to make a King Kong movie around the time of Godzilla, and pre-production was already underway. But Emmerich's movie's poor reception had him change course to The Lord of the Rings with that same crew. So who knows, maybe we would have never gotten the Lord of the Rings movies, at least in their current form, if Godzilla 1998 never happened. Godzilla would release in Japan on July 11, 1998, and the Japanese public took the bait just as the American public did. It would set an all-time high for opening day ticket sales in Japan with about 500,000 tickets being sold. And just like in the US, the numbers quickly dwindled from there after word of mouth and bad reviews poured in. Seeing this backlash, Toho started thinking it should capitalize, as this TriStar Godzilla did do one thing well. It had people clamoring for the old Godzilla. 
Almost immediately, Toho started talks on how to return the traditional Japanese Godzilla to the big screen. This was a direct response to what TriStar had done to their icon. Look on the mask with my boy. Next up, we kick off the Millennium series of Godzilla movies with 1999's Godzilla 2000 Millennium. <laughs> 